Good morning to everyone. Uh, the, for, thanks for joining in for the message portion of our uh, our worship service here at Smith's Cove Baptist Church, Sunday, August the 16th. And uh, I welcome each of our, our viewers and for those who may be watching later on YouTube, uh, we pray that the uh, the message is a blessing to your life and to your, your walk with God. Let me uh, share some scriptures with you this morning. The scripture reading comes from John's Gospel, chapter 14. I'm, I'm reading the first 12 verses. Jesus says to his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to the place where I'm going. But Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how do we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show me the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I'm in the Father and, and that the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because... I am going to the Father. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. A place where we can go and find the truth. For you are the author of truth. You're the author of life. So, Lord, we ask your continued blessing upon your heavenly word from the scriptures and your blessing upon the message to each of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you watch any amount of news these days, especially the news about and from the United States and their sources, it's really impossible to know just who is telling the truth about most everything. One person says one thing, another says something totally opposite, but they're both true. I'm telling the truth. Both of them will say that. Both claiming to try to tell the real truth. Now, this isn't something new to us, but more so today. In our day and age where we have difficulty knowing just what's fact and what's fiction. Some examples of what I've just referred to is the truths about COVID, politics, and we're not going there, but the list goes on and on. What will happen in each and every case of truth versus someone else's truth on, on the same subject? One thing for sure, it happens. It causes division, uncertainty, and sometimes even more severe, it causes violence and even hatred. One of the most oldest and most common subjects of debate is that of God and the entire subject concerning religion. And in the case or in the, the slant that I take today, in particular, the religion of Christianity, where we have God, we have Jesus, we have God's son, Jesus, who is God in the flesh, and we have God's Holy Spirit. My message last week, hopefully all of you have recovered, I was stepping on the toes of professed Christians that many don't share and live their life of faith like they could. The Christian faith in North America and in Western parts of the world has really become irrelevant to the current generation or much of it and the culture in which we live. But that's no reason to think for a moment to feel or to suggest that all this stuff about God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, all of this stuff that we find in the scriptures that somehow or, or another that's not true or it's not reliable. All what's going on is simply people of faith 
have lost their way in, in serving God first. And they end up, or we end up, living for ourselves first. And so with all those choices out there in what side to believe in all the matters of debate, in the realm of eternity, none of these debates matter one bit, except for one, the matter of coming to faith in the one true living God. And then for us as Christians, the matter of the, the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's facts to check for debates if we will bother to check to see if what we're hearing or seeing is true. Statements are made while other, well, the other side does their fact checking. And even then it's difficult to find the truth. When I was younger, maybe you can relate to this too. You never really heard too much of the term fact checking. We didn't need it because basically the truth was, well, the truth was being told more often. But our world is filled with deception and half-truths or white lies upon lies. And they're told to protect maybe the wealth of the rich or the positions of power and for many other reasons. This fact checking isn't much good either because one side will just say that the facts of the other side are false or they're fake. The challenge and the benefit we have as Christians is the facts that we proclaim or that we should proclaim are written in one place. And they are written thousands of years ago and anyone who wants to fact check only needs to turn to the scriptures. In today's day and age, many people will absorb what they are reading, what others have said, and, and rather than to check deeper into the information, they accept it is truth, and then they tell others. Before I go on in my manuscript, I mean, I've said from the pulpit before that as I preach and I teach about the scriptures, just don't swallow that as if I'm telling the absolute truth, which I would hope that I am. But you need to double check what I'm saying as it have, according it is to scripture. Okay, back to the manuscript. I joined Facebook January 1st this year, and boy, uh, was <laughs> I was surprised at what I see posted, and I'm being truthful, but I'm being sarcastic at the same time. I'm amazed at the amount of posts that people share, proclaiming one thing or another, choosing a side and maybe political debates, the stuff about COVID. I mean, some of you on Facebook, you see it. The truths or the deceptions, the stuff that people share, all kinds of things. Some are pictures, some are stories, some are headlines. And some of it, there isn't one shred of truth behind any of it. Yet it's shared as factual. I seen one this morning. Actually, I've seen it a couple different times that the WHO says that masks should only be worn by health professionals. Have you, any of you heard that? So whoever posted that, you might want to take that down. Here's another example, and then I'll move on. I noticed a week or so ago, maybe some of you seen it, it says late in August and it had this picture, looked like it might have been in the Middle East somewhere as so the buildings look kind of different from what I'm accustomed to. But anyway, there was the moon. And then there was another moon right beside it and it says late in the, in the month of August that there's going to appear like there's two moons in the sky. And I commented on the post, I'll believe that when I see it. I wish people would use Facebook to share their personal things that are appropriate, of course, but things that are known to be true and that the person that's posting it knows for a fact that it's true. Maybe with your own photo because you were there, not some photoshopped picture of two moons over these, these, this building that's never been seen before by humans, by the way. How do they get the picture of those two moons already if it hasn't happened yet? See? You got to use a little common sense sometimes. Maybe don't even turn the computer on. Instead, people share all kinds of misleading info that can only be deceiving. And at times it spreads division. It sparks hatred or worse. And regarding the scriptures, here's one I've seen a few times in the last couple of weeks, has a nice big picture of the new international Bible. And it says that there are 64,000 words missing out of it. And it says it's not true. 
but just planting the thought into someone's mind that there's a version of the Bible out there that there's a whole bunch of stuff missing in it. So, what do we do regarding that post? It's not the publisher that decides what goes into a version of the Bible. It's the scholars who are putting that information forward. But I say, again, for skeptics, for non-believers, when they see that, even though it says that it's not true, it starts the doubt. It just causes doubt all through deception and false facts. What I'm here to say is you already know that it's hard to find the truth in this world unless you're willing to dig for it. The truth on many matters can be found, but that requires you and I, a lot of times we'd have to be an expert in the field of debate. And we're not experts in so many of those fields. So it's not always easy to really get down to the bottom of the truth. But on the other hand, the Bible, even though we have it in, different, uh, in a different language than what it was originally written in, the basic message of creation, Jesus' sacrifice, his, his death and resurrection, the prophecies concerning past events as well as current and future events, you can find the truth about these things and more, and you can bank on it. Now, I'm going to share in today's message a portion of the message that I, I streamed live. It was early May, and it was midweek. It wasn't a Sunday message. And for those of you who have been turning into the Facebook live stream since COVID began, some of you may have already seen this and heard it, and I've kind of altered the message a bit more, actually cut it short, so it wasn't such a long sermon today. And at the time, I was just about to start an online emailable uh, Bible study of the Gospel of John. So moving on from here, here's some of what I said in that in that live stream. Seeing that I'm encouraging different folks to take part in a Bible study of John's Gospel, I thought it best to address those who are reluctant to take the study because of doubts, because of doubts about the truth or the validity of the scriptures. Because all too often, and maybe some of you too, you're poised with a question of how can a person expect what the Bible says to be true? And shortly after that question, other questions or comments will come about. Like it's not the word of God because it was written by people. And along with these kinds of thoughts and statements, there comes a comments that there's, there's too many versions. How can anyone know if it's accurate? And so with those thoughts and questions, we're going to take a few minutes and explain some of that. So if you picture in your mind for a moment, that you have something that needs to be written down? Maybe you sprained your, your right handed and you messed up your right hand and you can't write it down. Is it completely out of the question that you might have someone else write what you want said down on a piece of paper? Certainly not. So why can't God pick certain people through time in the past to record historical events and even have some of these people write down some things that's going to happen in the future called prophecy. If you can have someone write down something for you and it's true, why couldn't God have humans write down some things for him? So if we're willing to have an open mind, we have a couple of answers already. God had people write down what he and they wrote what he once said. God guided the people through his spirit as to what to write. And adding to that, the fact of prophecy is out of this world accurate. And this alone could be used for the sole proof that what we have for scriptures is reliable. And it is from God. People wrote what God instructed them to write. They were led by the spirit to write, sometimes at their own peril. Because at times authors were severely persecuted for their written work. And it's not like everyone was educated enough to write and not everyone was willing enough to risk their lives to write what God instructed. If you read some of the stuff that the prophets wrote in the Old Testament and how the people treated the prophets, it wasn't, it wasn't a job that everyone was claiming that they wanted. In the live stream back in May, I had some scriptures from 1 Peter chapter 1, Verses 3 to 12 It's just a, a portion of it where Peter's mentioning how salvation was predicted in the Old Testament. The suffering of the one who would bring this salvation was predicted. 
That's Jesus he's talking about. And Peter says of those prophets of old, they looked deeply into the word given to them. That would have been the scrolls, the letters of the prophets, these different written materials that were available to them already. Not quite the Old Testament as we, we know it. But they were looking into that material to see if they could determine just when this would happen, that this Messiah would come. Peter states, he says, that even angels look into that stuff because they didn't know. In 2 Peter, Peter says in verse, uh, chapter 1, verses 16 to 21, he says, we didn't follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of the Lord Jesus as he came in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when a voice came to him from, the, from heaven, saying, this is my son whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. Peter says, we ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven, and we were with him on that sacred mountain. And Peter continues, he says, we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you'll do well to pay attention to it. Like a light shining in a dark place. Above all, he said, you must understand that prophecy of scripture came about, not about by the prophet's own interpretation, but prophecies never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though they were human, spoke from God as they were carried along in the spirit. So if you've been following along in the online sermons and other materials that I've been sharing in the weeks since COVID began, you may recall I stated that the Bible is 25 to 30 percent prophecy. It's important. And why? Well, just a simple fact that God is proving himself to be just who he says he is by telling us with 100 percent accuracy what shall transpire in the future. And the Old Testament is full of it. Some of it came forth in the Old Testament. Some, some of it's coming forth into reality today. Some's left to come in reality in our futures. And humans cannot do that. God used people, told them the future and told them to write it down. So some wrote what would become our history. Some wrote a future events. And it's a way that God gives us to show that he's the real deal. Again, 2 Peter chapter 1. Above all, Peter says, remember the prophecy of scripture came about not by the prophet's own stuff that he cooked up in his own mind. It's strange that people will reject the scriptures. But they'll flock to a fortune teller for the future. Don't you think that God has a better handle on the future than a mere human? Or being led by the spirit who, who gave us the scriptures to believe in those very same scriptures, Old and New Testaments. Yes, humans wrote it. Yes, it's out of this world accurate. And yes, it's true. So hopefully this answers a few questions about who wrote the word of God. Humans wrote it. No one's denying that. As God led them to write what he wanted revealed. Next, how is it that we know that we, the Bible that we have, it still says what it originally said, that it hasn't been changed over the thousands of years and has transpired since it was written. Well, you would want to hope that for the average human being like you and I, that it doesn't say exactly what it said back then because we wouldn't have a clue. The Bible was written in different languages other than you and I write and speak in. Most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and some say a small portion of that was in Aramaic. The New Testament was written in Greek and we all could say amen, that's Greek to me. I don't understand that. And for the reasons of different languages depends, likely depends on the world powers, whoever was in power and that, that power was influencing their language and their culture. The cultures took on the language of those rulers. So when it comes to history, most of us would, would admit we don't debate much of what's been written in our history books. Many things of what's in the Old Testament, they can be verified by the materials written that are not biblical. It's the historical records of nations in the Bible, but they're also recorded in the nation's history books. And if you add more to this, 
in older languages, they didn't often have words to explain stuff that you and I know, or that we, like we have now. Languages were more primitive and even more complicated. Yes, even more complicated than the English language. So when the translators began to translate the books of the Bible from their original Hebrew and Greek, they took the greatest care to find words that would best explain some of these Hebrew and Greek words. They had to add English words to connect the dots, so to speak, so that we could read it with some sort of understanding. When we first met the, the Syrian family years ago, there they knew a half a dozen English words, not much. Even so, something so simple to say is, how are you feeling today? And once you use Google Translate to convert that into Aramaic, they yeah, come out all jumbled up. If you use something shorting like, are you well? They could pick that up much quicker. Language is a funny thing. The King James Version, which is what most of our families before us would have possessed as a Bible. That was put together in the early 1600s. But there's other parts of the Bible that had been translated into Latin and older English long before the King James Version. And coming up closer to our day and age, you may have heard of a place called Qumran. There in the mountainside caves in the Middle East, many manuscripts were found from the years 1946 and onward that were older manuscripts than what was previously used for our, many of our New Testament books. They're referred to as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Any written material, if you want more people to know about What's written? What do you do? Well, today we Xerox it. Today we email it, but we couldn't do that thousands of years ago. So you made copies. You made dozens of copies, hundreds of copies, thousands maybe, could be made of any one document. And some of what we have in our modern day translations of the Bible are based on new findings of those Dead Sea Scrolls. And some of those manuscripts that I mentioned already, they were older than the manuscripts that they had already. If you want what was originally said, the best information, the most accurate information you can have is the oldest information. By and large, the Bible's message, the Bible and its message has been given to us, it hasn't changed a bit. God is eternal. God created us, his prized possession of creation. God came to earth in the flesh, Jesus Christ, and he died for the sins of the world. He came back to life, resurrected from the grave, returned to heaven, and promises that he will return for us. We will go to heaven if we trust in him. And no matter what translation of the Bible you'll read, you'll find those basic truths throughout its pages. And if you don't, throw it out because it's not a Bible. The Bible's been translated into hundreds of languages and the English, English language has hundreds of versions of its own. Just because the language is different, or in the English language, that the English is more modern, this just doesn't take away from those general truths that I just mentioned. So yes, the language has been changed over thousands of years, but the message remains the same. And I believe that Satan tries to deceive people and has them doubting the truth of the scriptures because of some are all of that I've talked about in these previous pages. A little more help to validate what the Bible says is actually true. A course that I took along with dozens of other Christians over the years, it's an alpha course, and it, it stated that all kinds of written historical stuff that's not in the Bible, historical stuff written by people hundreds of years ago before Jesus, stuff about the nations, the cities, the countries, the wars, the overall history of people, places, and events. Of these ancient writings, there's only a very few copies, some of which covered a span of over a thousand years. And no one who's into history debates whether that stuff's true or not. They don't debate about who wrote it. Some of this stuff confirms the events that are even recorded in our Bibles. And if we look at the New Testament, all the manuscripts that were completed about 130 AD, 
the whole New Testament that we have, for the Protestant side of the church anyway, was put together by 300 AD. There was over 5,000 Greek copies, 10,000 Latin copies, and thousands of other copies in other languages. All different languages with the same basic message. So what, why debate whether the Bible has any reliability or be over-concerned with its authenticity? It beats me. When I was a kid, the only version I seen or read was the King James Version. For those of you who continue to read it or have read some of it, it has a lot of these and vowels and it's, for a lot of people, it's difficult. It's difficult to read because it's, it reads different than how we speak. And more modern versions have been created, some for youth, some for you and I who find it more difficult to understand that older English. And I personally refer newer translations as it seems to make sense to me to read something that I can understand better. Now, if I believe everything I've seen on Facebook, well, then I throw my new international Bible out. But that's the one I've been using for 25 years. No one's erased any words out of that since I have it. Sometimes I use the Living Bible. It has even more modern day language that you and I would speak. And if you don't have a Bible, you can go online and Google. Google Bible Gateway. You can find an online version. It's at your fingertips. And if you have difficult reading, there's audible versions as well. I posted all that information on the Smith Cove Baptist Church page on Facebook. Get into the word. Whatever version you use, either way, the general message that unites us, each of us as believers, is there is one true living God. There's not dozens of way to God. And if you think and believe that, then you don't know the truth. That Jesus Christ came to forgive us of our sins, the one true holy sacrifice. We can't work our way into heaven. We can't smile and hug trees enough to work our way into heaven. Jesus Christ is a risen living son of God and he's returning one day to take those who will truly believe in him to heaven. That's the message midweek, early in the month of May. I, I did that from home. I figured it was safer there that I wouldn't get stoned by people with rocks. If you're a skeptic of the whole Bible God thing, if you've come to the conclusion that it's all a bunch of stuff that weak people need and, and that religious people use to sound off to make them look better or to make your life miserable by giving you a whole bunch of rules, if that's what you think, if you think I'm beating up on you this morning, last week's message, I stepped on a lot of toes, probably with a lot of believers, I stepped on my own. But today what I've shared may help us as believers to have something to chew on to share with others, to say why the Bible is reliable. You want truth, you can seek it there. And if you haven't read the Bible and you don't believe in God, maybe I'm stepping on your toes today for whatever reason that you find yourself hearing this message. If you haven't read the scriptures, then you're really not informed enough to have an opinion of whether God is or not. And you might say, well, I was taught the theory of evolution in school and it says we came from monkeys and the Big Bang, uh, Big Bang caused creation and all that stuff. Yeah, and there's two moons that's going to be showing up over the earth there later on in the month. And if you think yourself so smart, why would you possibly make the mistake of buying into the theory, a theory of evolution, a theory that has more holes in it than Swiss cheese? And why would you swallow that hook, line, and sinker without checking, fact-checking the opposite side of the debate? Because there's lots of stuff out there that refutes evolution. I posted a video on the Smith Cove page about a dinosaur horn. It still has protein in it. It still has soft tissue in it. And all scientists will agree that if something was millions of years old, that stuff wouldn't survive. But you don't see that on mainline media. Why? If there is a God like the Christians proclaim there is, 
why would you not look into it? <coughs> Evolution is easier to believe maybe for some because then I can ignore a lot of what is going on. But if there is a shred of truth to the Bible and what Christians believe, and for you as a non-believer, you might think I'm in big trouble. It's easier to take in the side of evolution than it is to face up to God. So I'm just going to side with the evolution side. That's a big mistake. Why haven't you, because you are really a smart person, why haven't you checked out the Bible? An answer I get sometimes, I don't have the time. And that's not true. Because you'll always find the time to do what you want to do. A foundational answer as to why you don't believe, you're not going to like this one. The truth is there. It's in the scriptures. The main reason why many people don't read the Bible to see what it says to make an intelligent, informed decision is you're being lied to. You're being deceived. And not by the pain in that pastor. Not by the pain in the backside Christian that's been encouraging you to go to church or read the Bible or accept Jesus. You're being deceived by the master of deceiver, the father of lies. It's Satan himself. You just can't seem to grasp the truth because you're being blinded. You're being made deaf. I remember a movie years ago. Jack Nicholson, Tom Cruise. The movie was called A Few Good Men. And likely some of you have seen it. And in this particular scene, Jack Nicholson was on the witness stand and Tom Cruise is his top-notch lawyer and he's trying to squeeze the truth out of Jack Nicholson. And this got a pretty heated conversation. And Jack Nicholson, with his hair all out, not quite like the shiny, but his hair all out, he screams at, at Tom Cruise and he says, you can't handle the truth. I don't understand why non-believers are so adamant about rejecting something so good and so true. Something that most maybe really haven't investigated. I'm out of time. But the scriptures that I shared from John chapter 14, I'll leave you with this. Because Jesus states to his disciples, and he states to you and I, everyone that could hear. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one. This is God in the flesh. Saying of God the Father in heaven, no one gets to him except through me. So if you want the truth, you seek God in the scriptures. Prophecy is being fulfilled before your very eyes. Some of the stuff that you talk about and post about on Facebook and all that. One world governments and cashless societies and global catastrophes. All the stuff that you're talking about is in the Bible. It's coming someday. So don't be fooled by the father of lies. That's Satan himself. No one likes to be deceived. Your unbelief is the ultimate casualty of failing to seek the truth. All when it's been at your fingertips. So, or even, I stepped on Christian toes last week. I've given some Christians some tools to use with non-believers this week. And if you're a non-believer, I've stomped on your toes today. Maybe, but not out of malice, not out of anger. Just hoping and praying that you'll find the truth because you have nothing to lose. So if you're listening, those who still fail to see the value in Christ, I've just given you the truth. There's an obtainable source. So what will you do with it? Believe the word of God. Leave all those who have tried to encourage you to come to faith in Jesus Christ. You can do that. Or you can continue to believe the lies that Satan has laid out for the world to believe. And the very left, at the very least, I pray that you do some fact checking from the real source of truth. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I ask, Lord, that through your Holy Spirit, through your strength, the spirit of truth, that you help convict each heart, each soul, each spirit, Lord, of the truth. To help us to, to wade through all the deception that the father of lies spreads ever so subtly in our lives, in our, our cultures, in our community, 
in all the media that we take in. Help us to be mindful. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, and let's let's just close. Bow your heads together with me wherever you are online. And let's uh, let's recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, just bless each one here, each family member, extended family member watching. Bless us and protect us, Lord, and guide us in ways that are truly pleasing to you. Amen. Have a good week. Blessings upon your week. And don't forget, go wash your hands. Have a good day. <laughs>